Good evening and welcome to day two of Good News Conference 2021. We are pleased and delighted that you could join us once again. My name is Kulufe Lokele and I will be your host again this evening. Today is Holy Saturday, the day leading to Resurrection Sunday, where our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Amen. And now we are going into a time of worship shortly. And after that, Mrs. Koni Maswangani will encourage us with a word of offering. And then our main ministry for this session will be delivered by Pastor Randy Roybaki, who is the lead pastor of United Church in Van de Bale Park. We hope that you enjoy the rest of the service. between where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone there was another in the fire standing next to me there was another in the waters holding back the seas should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free the cross that burst the burning Where another died for me There is another in the fire All my dead left for dead beneath the water longer a slave to my sin anymore Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning Either way I won't bow to the things of this world I know I know I will never be alone There is another in the fire And this reckoning I know I will never be 
testifying of the Son, one desire. Spirit come, Spirit come, Spirit revival. Profess my like it is done, one desire. It is the one desire Continue burning for our King is soon returning. As we hold to this assurance, Spirit come, Spirit come, Spirit come, Spirit come. Greetings, People's Church family. Today is Easter Eve, the day before Jesus rises from the dead. As we celebrate the peak of our love story with God, we will read from the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The verse begins with the reason why. For God so loved the world. Love. Love is an action. Without the action, do we know if there's really any love? Jesus made it clear to Nicodemus that God's show of love is in his giving. The word of God reads as follows. Dear children, let us not merely say what we, that we love each other, let us show the truth by our actions. That's from the book of 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. Secondly, love is service, unpaid service. Being a servant is not easy. It requires that we give up our comfort, that we share our belongings. It can sometimes take us out of our way, make us change our plans, our plans with our time, our plans with what we pay attention to, 
and even our plans with our money. It is risky because our service may end up unappreciated and sometimes not even returned. And all these things put together are what makes love a sacrifice. Lastly, love is a choice. Jesus says in John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35, that he gives us a new commandment to love him and to love each other. We should not take for granted that God set some of our existence in autonomy. For example, the way an eye flicks close when an intruding object flies over or into the eye. He could have just built us to love reflexively. As we can see, he commands us to choose to love and God wants for us to choose to love him and others. We can show God and others our love by choosing to act by serving them. So God made a choice to serve us without benefit because he is so extravagant in showing his love for us, saving us from ourselves. As we give today, let us be mindful that we only need to do so if this is an act that shows our love for him. It is love when this action is not well-timed or comfortable because you may only have little or no more left in the coffers. It is love when your hard-earned money is offered by you to be part of the ministry and service of His Holy Church here on earth. The best part is that this sacrificial show of your love is to a God who sees your heart appreciates your service and he is faithful. It is love when you are not manipulated, forced or cornered, but when you choose to give. Let us pray as we give our offering. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. We are so grateful for your word and what your word is revealing to us. Papa, we want to worship you with our sacrifices and our offerings. Help us with the intentions that are in our hearts. Help us to be able to love you the way that you loved us. Help us to, to love others the way that you loved us. We are grateful that everything we have comes from you and we are grateful to be able to put it back into your kingdom. This we thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hello, People's Church, Polo Kwane. Hey, it's so good to be with you. What an honor to be able to serve you in this way. For a second, I just want to take the time and honor Pastor Mondley and Kolo, phenomenal friends of ours, building a phenomenal church with you guys. And I'm so excited to see what God has done, but also what God will continue to do. Hey, let me encourage you, continue to honor your leaders, continue to pray for them, lift them up in prayer, because the task that God has called them to is absolutely phenomenal, and they're going to need your help, and they're going to need your prayers. And so, hey, let us continue to honor them and serve them as God calls them to build His church. What an honor to be a part of building the kingdom of God. Before I begin, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Randy, and I'm the lead pastor of United Church in Funda Bale Park in the Deep South. We're like on the border, the last little border of Gauteng. And so if you ever find yourself in this part of the world, why don't you pay us a visit whenever you get a chance? And um, hey, here's a picture of my beautiful family. This is my wife. Her name is Shani, and my two kids, my son is Levi. He's five years old. And my daughter's name is Amelia, and she turns three, but it feels like she's 23. Please pray for us. When you've got little ones like this, life can be a mess. But hey, let's get straight into the message. I don't want to take too much time. Let us pray, and let us get into it today. Dear God, we thank you for the privilege of meeting together at this time. Though we meet online, there is still power in community and connection. And so, Jesus, may you be with us. Thank you for the fact that we can commemorate your life, death, and sacrifice for us. And so may this message bring life, 
May it bring hope, and may it teach us what you are wanting to speak into our hearts today. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, I've got the privilege of sharing just a few thoughts on what it means to be built to last. I love this vision of yours, and I love what you guys are speaking about. I love one of the definitions of what it means to be built to last is being able to withstand the test of time, being able to withstand the test of time. Everything that God has created has been built to last. Isn't that true? God doesn't do things just quickly. God doesn't just do things as a fly by night. When God establishes something, He establishes it to last. You know, when I think about the illustration of this, I think about how there are some machines that are built, but it doesn't always feel like they are built to last. Isn't that true? However, if we do want them to last, usually it comes with some sort of um, instruction manual or some sort of boundary or some sort of care instruction to show you how to care for it so that it lasts. I mean, think about it. When you buy your clothes, there's normally a tag at the back that says, you know, do not dry clean or, you know, don't iron too hot, otherwise you burn the fabric. When you buy your phone or any technological device, it comes with, you know, with warning labels that we don't usually read. We just take our stuff out the box and we throw it away because, you know, we'll sort that out later. And we don't, we don't, we don't take the time to read it. And so normally those instructions help us to care for it so that it can last. Isn't that true? I thought about when you buy a car. Many of you uh, might have had to buy a car for yourselves or maybe have driven in someone else's. And when you look at a car, I love the analogy of a car. In fact, that's the image that I want to use today in order to help drill this in for you and for me to understand. When you think of a car, a car has so many elements attached to it in order to not only protect us, but to protect what it comes with. So you've got the engine right up in the front, and the engine is normally protected by a bonnet and a grill that helps protect the car from the weather elements, but also make sure that the engine is neatly tucked away so that no harm comes to it. Have you ever noticed, you know, we don't drive around, our, uh, around town or around the country with our bonnets open. Well, at least we shouldn't. Hopefully, you're not doing that. Um, you shouldn't be doing that because the bonnet just helps keep the engine closed. It helps protect it from elements so that your engine can last and your car can take you further where you need it to be, right? You've got a windscreen. What does your windscreen do? Your windscreen protects you from whatever is coming towards you while you are driving. And so normally if you're driving at night, you would know that, you know, you're driving to all sorts of bugs and insects and, you know, all sorts of flying creatures. Imagine your windscreen wasn't there. Suddenly everything coming your way would fly straight into your face. And the last thing you want to be doing is driving down the road going, you know, spitting out all sorts of bugs. You don't want to do that. And so your windscreen's there to protect you from that. Also from harmful, dangerous objects. If anything comes flying from the road, it hits your windscreen first. And you might have known what that feels like if you've ever had your windscreen being hit by something. And then finally, for the passenger in the car, you've got all sorts of safety elements. You've got your seat belt, which is there to protect you so that if you do end up in a collision, you know, you don't go flying out the car. You've got airbags that are neatly tucked away, so when something happens, it just pops out and keeps you in the right place. All of these are set in place so that not only the engine, but the passenger are protected so that it takes you further and so that you last. If you want your vehicle to last, you need to care for it well. Care for the engine, make sure that all the safety protocols are observed, then your vehicle will last. But if you, want the, if you want the passenger to be safe, make sure you observe the limitations. If you take care of it, it benefits you. But if you neglect it, you put yourself at risk. Isn't that true? I mean, imagine just tomorrow morning all of us decides, you know what, all of these boundaries, all of these limitations they really just cramping our style. I'm just going to take my bonnet, chuck it off. I'm going to take my windscreen off because I want to feel the wind in my hair as I drive, you know, whatever hair is left. You know, if we just decide to do that, what do we do? We put ourselves at risk. Don't we do that? If you decide to remove all of that, you put yourself at risk. This is the analogy that I want to use as I speak about how the church has been made to last. In Scripture, we learn that the church is God's chosen vehicle for transformation. Jesus says, I will build my church. The church is God's chosen vehicle for transformation in our, in our world and in our community. God chose the church to do or to outwork His purpose for creation. I love the church. I've decided to give my life to the church. This is what I believe God has called me 
to do. And many other leaders and many other people in your church have been called to be a part of building God's church. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, um, it says, This is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of truth. Paul understood what the church was and the power that it carried. It was the foundation and the pillar of truth. We need to understand that the church is God's chosen vehicle for transformation. And Jesus says, I will build my church. I will build it. And when I build it, it is built to last. It's not a fly by night. It's not a come and go. It's not just another organization or corporation that comes one generation and is gone the next. No, the church has withstood the test of time. The church has endured perse- uh, persecution. It's endured all sorts of Um, all sorts of external elements, and it is still here. And you know what? Long after you and I are gone, it will still be here because the church is God's chosen vehicle for transformation. Yet when God established the church, or when Jesus establishes the church, He creates limitations around it to make sure that it will last. Here are just a few examples. I can't dig into all of them for the sake of time. But one of the things that the church is meant to observe is to submit to the authority of Jesus. Like Matthew 16, 19 says, Jesus says, I will build it. It is Jesus' church, not yours and mine, to do with what we want. Jesus is the author, and He is in authority over the church. And so if the church wants to last, it needs to be submitted to the authority of Jesus. It needs to be led and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We see this in Acts chapter 2, when Jesus commissions and we see the birth of the church. He says, and the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses. And the Holy Spirit will empower you to be who I've called you to be, to be the church. And so if the church is going to last, it needs to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We cannot do this in our own strength. It won't last if we try to do it ourselves. We need to observe the sacraments of baptism and communion. That's what Jesus left us with. He said in the Great Commission, when you you go out into all the world and make disciples, baptize them. Make sure that you baptize them into repentance so that they understand what they are doing. Baptize them into the resurrection of Jesus. We baptize them so that they live in the resurrection. That is what we are commemorating this weekend. And then we see communion as well. Jesus said, whenever you do this, remember me. Communion keeps the sacrifice of Jesus at the forefront of our lives. And so this is what we are called to observe so that we are never tempted to do with it what we will. And then finally, we need to honor the Great Commission. Like I mentioned earlier, Matthew chapter 28. If the church is going to last, we need to honor the Great Commission and the Great Commandments that Jesus has given us to honor, and to follow. And so this function uh, functions as the engine that causes the church to continue going. And if it's going to continue going and get us to where God has called us to be, we need to make sure that we observe all of these and care for them well. It's kind of like, you know, when you drive your car, you need to make sure the engine is taken care of. Make sure you top it up with oil. Make sure you've got water. Make sure you've got fuel so that it can keep going. The moment you neglect that, you put the engine At risk. The moment you and I neglect what Jesus has called us to observe, we put the church at risk. We are called to constantly observe this. And then, secondly, the second element to that is the passenger. So, if we see the church as the vehicle, then you and I are the passengers who help the vehicle get to where it needs to go. And so, in the same way, God has given us limitations and boundaries to observe to keep us safe and to help us keep going the way God has called us to go. So for an example, for you and I, out of all the things that's given, just a few things to mention, He's called us to honor God first and foremost. For an example, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, it says, hey, honor the Lord, trust God, um, put Him first in your life, put Him first in all that you do. And if we do this, we make sure that we function with God at the forefront of our lives. We don't move Him to the side. God is at the front. He's called us to observe and keep the Sabbath. We see this in Exodus chapter 31, verse 16. Why? Because when you and I observe the Sabbath like, like Sabbath, like God has called us to do, we don't end up running dry and running in our own strength. We are constantly empowered from a place of love, from a place of relationship with God. See, many people don't observe this, and so we find ourselves running dry, and we end up not lasting 
the race. We end up not, be, not, not having endurance to last until the end because we don't observe the principles that God has called us to observe, observe. He said to us that we need to live generously and care for the poor. Why? Because then we maintain an outward focus. Rather than maintaining an inward focus, the church maintains an outward focus. You and I always think about others. That's one of the values for our church at United Church. In fact, the vision for the year for us is to make 2021 a year for others. If the church is going to last and get to where God has called it to be, it needs to constantly be outward focused. We need to forgive quickly, like Ephesians 4 verse 32 says. Don't hold on to grudges. Forgive quickly. Why? Because if we hold on to grudges, what ends up happening is we short circuit our growth and progress, and we end up stagnating ourselves. People who don't forgive don't go very far, because the forgiveness does more harm on the inside than what we realize it does. And so we are called to forgive quickly if we're going to go on the mission that God has called us to go on. We are called to live justly, like in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 17. It says, learn to do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the orphans, and, um, and fight for the widows. And so if we are going to last and go where God has, God has called us to be, if we are going to be God's chosen vehicle for transformation, then you and I need to observe all of these. And then finally, we are called to live generously through tithing and honoring God, like Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all that you acquire. Why? Because if we do this, we allow the church to keep being the church. If we withhold that, we short circuit the impact the church can have. See, all of these things are set in place for the church to continue being the vehicle that God has called it to be. And for you and I, as the passengers, to allow the vehicle to do what the vehicle has been meant to. To do. See, if we don't observe these boundaries that God gave us, we not only put the vehicle at risk, we put ourselves at risk. We, we stop the vehicle from doing what it's meant to do, or we stop ourselves from doing what we are meant to do. And here's the problem with our culture today, or the challenge that I find, is many people look at these boundaries or the laws that God has given, and they feel like it is more limiting than it is liberating. And so what our culture does is our culture removes all the boundaries that God has given. The the culture says, you know what, we don't really need the bonnet. Um, We're just going to do away with that because the bonnet kind of prevents us from really seeing what's meant to go on. And we don't need the windscreen. It just kind of has this boundary in. And we want to remove that. And so they remove the windscreen. And you know what, these doors kind of limit my freedom of movement. And so we remove the doors. And what ends up happening is we sit with the shell. And when we are exposed to the elements and when life doesn't go our way and we are more at risk of getting hurt, we end up looking at God and saying, what happened? And God is like, well, I had given you boundaries to observe. You didn't observe them. And unfortunately, your relationship, your marriage, your business, your family might not last because you have chosen to remove the boundaries that I've set in place. And for you and I, we sometimes, if we are not careful, we can end up removing the boundaries, the limitations that God had set in place to guard us so that we can last. If you want your business to last, apply the principles that God has given us regarding business. If you want your family to last, apply the principles that God has given us so that families could last. Honor each other, a function with mutual submission for one another, love unreservedly, forgive quickly. When we do these things, we begin to last. Same as with the church. If you and I can be selfless when it comes to the church, serve humbly, serve one another, pray for one another, love unconditionally, forgive quickly, tithe, make sure that you are generous, care for the poor, honor God, function from the power of the Holy Spirit. When we do this, the church will last. When we fail to do this, we put the church at risk. See, the church has and will continue to stand the test of time. The church will always remain resilient. The church will always continue to grow despite its persecution and opposition. Why? Because the church is God's chosen vehicle for the transformation of the world that God has put us in. The church will continue to be God's chosen vehicle. God hasn't chosen anything else. 
He hasn't changed his mind. He hasn't been like, okay, well, let's put the church aside um, and let's try something else. Let's try a nonprofit or let's try a business or a corporation. No, God still has chosen the church and he will continue to choose the church. And you and I are called to be a part of the church, called to grow the church, build the church, equip the church so that the church will continue to be the vehicle of transformation. And if you and I are gonna observe this, And if we're going to honor this, and if we're going to commit to this, we don't do it on our terms. We do what God has called us to do. We honor God. We function from the Holy Spirit. We pray for one another, lay hands on each other, pray for the sick. We are empowered by God. Observe the Sabbath. Make sure that you get the rest you need so that you can be equipped to do what God has called you to do. And then live generously and tithe to your church. As we do this, we allow the church to continue being the church. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, as I get ready to wrap up, it says, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit, your soul, and your body be kept blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Essentially, what Paul is praying for is that we would be built to last that our whole souls, our whole spirits, and our whole bodies would be preserved so that we can last up until Jesus comes again. If that is Paul's desire for the church and Paul's desire for you and for me, then that needs to be our desire as well. And this is what Jesus had in mind when he said, I'm building my church, not for you and I to do what we want to do, but for you and I to equip others so that they too can be preserved until he comes returns. And so, hey, People's Church, my challenge for you today, as we are built to last, may we build on the principles that God has called us to build. Let us not neglect it. Let us not cast it aside. Let us not sideline it. Let us not chuck it aside because it kind of limits us or holds us back. Let us observe it with commitment and let us observe it with strength so that we can be the church that God has called us to be. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that today we have the opportunity to observe the principles you have called us to observe. Forgive us for the times we try to function in our own strength. Forgive us for the times when we haven't put you first. Forgive us for the times when we haven't lived justly, when we haven't cared for the poor, where we haven't been outward focused. Forgive us for the times when we've been selfish, Forgive us for the times when we've held on to our resources and not honored your word that instructs us to be generous. For we know that all of these things together work for the functioning of the church. And so today, may we be equipped and empowered by you, Holy Spirit, to be the church that you've called us to be. Each and every one of us as individuals, as we begin to observe all of these. May we become the church that you have called us to be. May we be built to last, and may we continue to be the vehicle of transformation to a broken, hurting world around us. Cause us to rise up so that we can be built to last. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I pray this was a good encouragement. I pray that it helped you, and I pray that it will move you forward to where God is calling you to be. Thank you so much for having me, and I pray that you will have a blessed, blessed Easter weekend. Be blessed. What a lovely message from Pastor Randy. Indeed, everything that God created is built to last, and the church is definitely a vehicle for transformation. And now for session four, we are going to receive the word of God from our very own Pastor Mondli Kele. He also takes us through one of the most emotionally charged days in all of Jesus' public ministry, which is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he looks at it from the angle of the cup of God's anger. We hope that the word today transforms your life and ministers into your life. Enjoy. So good evening. We hope that you are still enjoying the conference so far. And I really trust that God has already done a work in your life. And for tonight's session, I'm going to be focusing on Matthew chapter 26 from verse 36 
to 46, and this is how it reads. It says, Then Jesus went with them, talking about the disciples. He went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So, leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. We pray, Father God, that you may do your work in us through this word. Through this word, Father God. Pray that you may speak into our lives, that you may transform us, that you may change and transform our view of you and our view of the Lord Jesus. Help us to appreciate what you did for us this weekend so many years ago. Pray for all this in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen. So this account for me is definitely or certainly one of the most emotionally charged days in all of Jesus' earthly ministry. Think about it. They had just finished eating the Passover meal, where Jesus pretty much revealed that Judas would hand him over to his enemies. Shortly after that, Jesus told Peter that Peter would deny him three times that very same evening. And then now, Jesus takes the disciples to a place called Gethsemane, which means the oil press. And this is where we get this account that we have just read. And we are told that Jesus prayed earnestly for the Father to take the cup away from him. And I'm not sure if there is another instance in the entire Bible where Jesus prayed and said the same thing three times. We are told that he, you know, he prayed two times for, for that man to, to be healed, or for his blindness to be healed. But here we are told that Jesus prayed and said the same things Three times. This for me demonstrates the seriousness of the issue Jesus was praying about. This wasn't one of those things that you just pray once and completely forget about. This was more serious than that. It literally was a matter of life and death. And think about this. This was this evening. This, uh, what is happening now, was actually the culmination of Jesus' entire earthly life and ministry. Everything in his life had been pointing to this very moment. This was the night that he would willingly give his life as a ransom for many. From the moment he was born, from as early as that, and each and every passing day from that moment brought him one day closer to this very moment. And now the moment had come, and it was as real as ever. And so the thing that I want us to focus on tonight is just this issue of the cup, where Jesus prays three times for the Heavenly Father, for His Father, to let this cup pass away from Him. What was this cup that Jesus was praying about? And so it's difficult to know for sure, uh, but there are definitely some hints and some clues when you read the scriptures. And what Jesus says to the disciples in verse 41 definitely is one of the clues. And for me, it, 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 it's almost like a window that helps us to see, you know, what was happening in Jesus' spirit, in Jesus' mind, and in Jesus' heart at that moment, where he says to the disciples, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And this statement was definitely true of the disciples at that moment. But I think that it could have been true of Jesus as well. On the one hand, 
His spirit was completely on board with God's plan for his life. But on the other hand, you know, his flesh, his humanity wanted something that was completely different, which is not unlike us. Think about it. Sometimes we also find ourselves fired up to pray or fired up to do something good for God. But the reality of the situation is that we are tired at that moment or we are not feeling well and our flesh simply wants to go to sleep. And remember that Jesus, it was very important and necessary for Jesus to be made to be like us as much as possible with, with the exception that he was not a sinner, you know, that he did not sin. But in every other respect, it was necessary for him to be made like us as much as possible. And we can uh, know about that through Hebrews chapter 2. When you read Hebrews chapter 2, it tells us that Jesus had to be made like us. And so what that means is that um, he would have felt all the emotions that you and I would feel if we were under the same situation, that he faced all the temptations that we would also face if we were in his shoes in that evening. He also faced all the pressures that we would also have felt under the same situation. If you put yourself in his shoes and you begin to just think about all the things that were going through his mind, all the things that he was facing at that moment, he was facing because he was human. And he even says to his disciples, he says, my soul is extremely sorrowful, even to the point of death. And this was, for me, revealing to us his humanity, his frailty, and the fact that he was made human, he was made like us. He, he, he succumbed, his soul was feeling sorrowful, extremely, in that particular evening, because of what laid ahead for him. And in his prayer, Jesus demonstrates when he prays to the Father, he demonstrates to us what submission most of the time will look like. You know, that one can submit to God's plan even when everything within us does not want to do so. Even when our body does not want to do so, we can still submit to the plans and to the purposes of God for our lives. Jesus was unwaveringly committed to doing God's will for his life. Yet at the same time, his humanity struggled coming to terms with what that would look like in his life. And this is the important thing for us to note here, that Jesus was human just as we are. You know, he needed to be human. He needed to face the same temptations that we also face. But the one major difference between him and all of us is that while we are sinners, while we have committed sins in our lives, Jesus was absolutely spotless and perfect. And you find a lot of different uh, of, of references in the scriptures uh, when it comes to the cup. There's a lot of, of uh, references to the cup. When you read the scriptures, most especially when you read the Old Testament, but certainly even in the New Testament, there's a lot of references. And we're just going to uh, focus on one today. And it's the one that you find in Jeremiah chapter 25. And, and before we, we go to, the, to that actual scripture, Jeremiah had a very difficult job. Jeremiah was a prophet sent by God to proclaim to the nation of Israel and to proclaim to, to other nations in the world, to proclaim the judgment of God upon them. And the, and the hope was that the nations, you know, the nation of Israel, the people, when they hear that God is going to judge them because of their sins, that they would repent. That was, that was his job. You know, that was his his calling was to go and proclaim this judgment, this message of judgment to the whole world with that hope that people would repent. And in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 15, this is what we find. It says, Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. If you go to verse 27 to 29, this is what he continues to say. God says, then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, drink, be drunk and vomit. 
fall and rise no more because of the sword that I am sending among you. And if they refuse to accept the cup from the hand, from your hand to drink, then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, you must drink for behold, I begin to work disaster at the city that is called by my name. And shall you go unpunished? You shall not go unpunished for I am summoning a sword against all the inhabitants of the earth declares the Lord. And this was God's judgment on the nations for their sins and rebellion. And he says, not even the city that is called by my name will be able to escape this. So do you think that you will be able to escape it? Surely not. If the city that is called by my name will also not escape, you will also not be spared of this judgment. This is the judgment that was going to go into all the, uh, the inhabitants of the earth, as he says. And you may be asking yourself right now, why would a loving God do such a thing? to his creation and the short and, and and simple answer to that is this it is because that's exactly what we deserve think about it in in the world right now think about all the violence all the bloodshed all the corruption all the greed all the hatred all the selfishness and depravity that goes on in the world right now because of all these things God is going to judge or, or sending this judgment to all the nations. And in verse 30 to 31 of the same chapter, this is what Jeremiah wrote. It says, Jeremiah, prophesy against them. Tell them the Lord will roar from heaven like a lion. His voice will sound like thunder from his holy temple. There, he will roar loudly against his land. He will shout like those who stomp on grapes in the winepress. He will shout against everyone who, who lives on earth. The noise of battle will be heard from one end of the earth to the other. That's because the Lord will bring charges against the nations. He will judge every human being. He will kill sinful people with his sword. And here is the thing. This prophecy along with so many other uh, uh, judgment prophecies, especially in the Old Testament, were actually uh, prophesying about a future judgment, which is called the capital D, Day of Judgment. If you've seen those uh, uh, references in the Bible, it's the capital D, Day of Judgment, or the Day of the Lord. That is what they were actually uh, prophesying about. They were prophesying about that judgment in the future, where God will judge each and every person who has ever walked the earth and there's so many prophets in the old testament that actually prophesied about that day that day of the lord that the, the the day of judgment that is coming in the future and jeremiah was joining those ones and also prophesying uh, when it comes to that judgment and there's so many prophets as i've already mentioned that prophesied uh, uh, about that day of judgment. You can think about Joel. You can think about even Zephaniah, Isaiah. There's so many prophets that actually prophesied about it. And so I'm just going to read just two uh, prophecies that prophesy about that day of judgment. And the first one is in Joel chapter 2, just verse 1 and 2. It says, Priests, blow the trumpets in Zion. Give a warning on my holy mountain. Let everyone who lives in the land tremble with fear. The day of the Lord is coming. It is very near. That day will be dark and sad. It will be, bla it will be black and cloudy. A huge army of locusts is coming. They will spread across the mountains like the sun when it rises. There has never been an army like it. And there will never be another for all time to come. This is the, the judgment day that that um, God sent prophets to prophesy about and to warn the nations about in Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 14 to 17 this is what it says it says the great day of the Lord is near in fact it is coming quickly the cries on that day are bitter the mighty warrior shouts his battle cry at that time I will pour out my anger there will be great suffering and pain it will be a day of horrible trouble it will be a time of darkness and gloom 
gloom. It will be filled with blackest clouds. Trumpet blasts and battle cries will be heard. Soldiers will attack cities that have forts and corner towers. I will bring great trouble on all people. So they will feel their way around like blind people. They have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust. Their bodies will lie rotting on the ground. Their silver and gold won't save them on the day the Lord pours out his anger. The whole earth will be burned up when his jealous anger blazes out. Everyone who lives on earth will come to a sudden end. That is the judgment day. That is the day when God judges each and every person, each and every nation that is on the face of the planet. And what they are saying is that the day of the Lord is coming. And they are saying it is very near. And the first question is, if it was very near then, how close is it today? If it was very near, you know, during the Old Testament times, how close is the day of the Lord today? It is, I mean, it is unimaginably close. It is any day from now, it could come upon us. And there is one, uh, there is no one who is exempt from that coming judgment. That is the other thing that is clear. All the nations, each and every person, human being who has ever been born and who has ever walked the earth will stand before God and be judged on that day. So no one will be able to escape. And Paul puts it this way. He says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10 to 11, it says, as it is written, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. And so no one is good enough to escape the coming judgment. No one does what is right. No one seeks after God. We all deserve to actually drink from the cup of the anger of God because we are all guilty. We are all sinners. No one, you know, is the exception to this. We all deserve what is coming, which is when, it, when the day of judgment comes. But there is good news. I'm not just going to leave you with bad news. There is good news. And the good news is that God has made a way for you and I to be able to escape the coming day of judgment. And you may be asking yourself, how has God done that? How has God made that way? And it is in this way. It, it is when, when he caused his one and only son to drink from the cup of the anger of God on your behalf and on my behalf, on behalf of every individual person who has ever walked the earth. Jesus is the son of God that God caused to drink from the cup of the wrath of God that was set apart for us, but he drank it on our behalf. And so when, when Jesus was, was praying in the garden, God took the collective sin and guilt of the entire world and placed it upon him and placed it upon Jesus. And on the cross, G God punished Jesus for the sins of the entire world. Jesus is the one sacrifice that takes away the entire sins and the, and the guilt of the entire world, of all of humanity, of, huma of humanity. And Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 21. Paul says, for our sake, you and I, each and every person who has ever walked the earth, for our sake, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus did the absolutely unimaginable thing. He took our place and offered to drink the cup of the anger of God on our behalf. And it was necessary for God's demand of his justice to be satisfied. So it was necessary for punishment to take place for the sake of our sins and for the sake of our guilt. It was necessary for someone to be punished for it. And so for God to be a just God, he needed to punish the guilty. That is just simple. That is just straightforward. For God to be just, for God to be fair, he needed to punish the guilty, which is us. Or the other alternative, is it was for him to provide someone who would become the scapegoat and take the punishment on behalf of the guilty, which is what he did. There was no other way for God to justify the guilty without actually serving the punishment, without, you know, causing the guilty to drink from the cup of his wrath 
or to make someone else drink it on their behalf. And that is the choice that God chose, was to, was to let us go free, but to punish his one and only son and to cause his son to drink from the cup that was set for us, the cup of the anger of God. But there is a catch. And this is what this all means. And I need you to understand and to hear me very carefully. The, the, the thing that I'm saying is that God has made a way for you and I to be justified without you and I actually having to drink from the cup of his righteous anger on our behalf. That is the thing that I just said. And he did that by causing his own son to drink of that cup on our behalf. And this is the important part. Each and every person needs to accept what Jesus did for them personally. No one can do that on your behalf. And equally important, you cannot do that on anyone else's behalf. Each and every person needs to accept what God has done for them through Jesus personally for themselves. And so if for whatever reason you choose not to accept Jesus' offer of salvation through placing your faith in him and on his finished work on the cross, what he did for you, if for whatever reason you choose not to do that, when the day of God's judgment comes, you will have to drink of the cup of God's wrath on your own. For your own sins, you will have to do that for your own because God has given you the option. He has given you the choice, you know, to accept what, what God has done on your behalf and you chose not to. So then when that day comes, you will have to drink of that cup. You will have to take whatever is coming, whatever punishment that is coming. And you know what the worst thing about that is? The worst thing is that you will not be able to blame anyone else but yourself. You know, because you had the chance, you had the option, and you chose not to. And so in other words, what I'm saying is that salvation is not automatic. Each person needs to believe in Jesus for their own salvation. And as I conclude, if you right now would not say you are a born-again believer, you would not say that you have ever, you know, accepted Jesus into your life, the bad news of, uh, that I'm bringing to you tonight is that God is really angry with you. That is the bad news, you know. And you may be asking yourself, why is God angry with me? Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 1 from verse 21 to 23, speaking about each and every person who has ever walked the earth. He says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. What Paul is basically saying here is that although we instinctively knew that there is a God, there is a creator who created all these things, we chose to, to replace him with all these other um, created things. We chose to create him with, uh, I mean, to replace him with idols, to replace him with success, to to replace him with fame and all these other things that we chase after. But we knew, that's the point, we knew that there is a, a creator, we knew that there is a higher power. Although we knew him, we did not pay any attention to him, we did not seek him, we did not try to live the way that he wants us to live. So we are all guilty because we knew, you know, in our consciences that there is a creator. When you look outside, when you look at the created things, when you look at a sunset, when you look at the stars at night, you will know that that these things did not just create themselves. There is a creator behind all of these things. And the good news is that on the cross, Jesus diverted all of that anger away from you and towards himself. That is the good news. That on the cross, Jesus was diverting all of that anger that was, that was pointed towards you. He diverted it towards himself. That Jesus took the cup of God's anger that was meant for you and I, and he drank it all right up until that last drop. And as he hung upon that cross, as he was being crucified, he drank all that just anger of God that was meant for you, that was meant for me. And, and as he said, it is finished. He meant, you know, it is done. The mission has been accomplished. The payment has been paid in full. You know, that debt has been paid in full. You 
can go scot-free. He has done what you couldn't do for yourself. That is what Jesus did for you on the cross. And on the other hand, if you have given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't want you to feel afraid. You know, I don't want you to feel you know, scared because of all these Bible references that I've read. If you have given your life to Jesus Christ, God is not angry with you. God loves you. God adores you. God delights in you. When God sees you, he sees the, the, the perfect life that his son Jesus lived. Because you have accepted Jesus. You have accepted what he has done on your behalf. And so God had to treat Jesus like the worst of sinners on the cross. So that he could treat you once you have accepted Jesus like his one and only son who was spotless, who is perfect who lived a sinless life. That is the exchange that happened on the cross, that Jesus took your place so that you could be reconciled to God. And so God is not angry with you if you are a believer. When you put your faith on Jesus' finished work on the cross, you become the righteousness of God. And that is what you are if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ. And that is what we celebrate. That is what we remember this weekend. We celebrate and we, and we praise and we sing about the mercy uh, and the grace of the benevolent, uh, you know, and the benevolence of our gracious and generous God. That is what we sing about, the mercy that we have received and the grace that we have received uh, that has resulted in our salvation and the forgiveness of our sins. And if you have never actually given your life to Jesus Christ, if you have never accepted him to be the Lord and Savior of your life, I am here to tell you tonight that it is not too late, that the opportunity is still there, the invitation is still open. You can still make a decision right now to surrender your life to Jesus. And you may be asking yourself, what does that mean, surrendering your life? It means you make a decision right now to stop trying to be good enough through your own strength, through your own attempts, but choosing to accept what God has already done for you by sacrificing his one and only son on the cross. It means accepting God's offer of salvation and forgiveness of sins by believing in Jesus and living the life that from this moment onwards, living the life that God wants you to live. And you may be asking yourself, how do I take this step? What do I need to do? And if you read Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Paul, uh, sim I mean, Peter simplifies it. He gives us just two things. He says you need, to, you need to repent and you need to get baptized. And the first one, repentance. I'll go through it quickly. Repent repentance basically means to do an about turn, to turn around from your life where you are living for yourself on your own terms and turn towards God and discover what he wants for you. Discover the life that he wants you to live and live according to his word. That is what repentance means. And baptism is very simple as well. It is a very important step of obedience for each and every believer. It is a public and symbolic declaration of your decision that you have made to accept Jesus into your life and, and to live according to his ways. You make a decision, you get baptized in water as a symbol to declare, you know, to, to proclaim that indeed you are now a follower of Jesus Christ. And my hope is that you will make this decision, that you will not, um, you will not delay this decision, that you will not postpone it for another time. Because who knows, you might not get that time. That is my hope, that you make this important decision for yourself. That is my hope and my prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord God Almighty, for what you have done for us on the cross of Calvary where you sent your son to be a substitute for us, to, to, um, to take upon himself the punishment for our guilt so that our sins may be forgiven and we could become the righteousness of God. Help us, Lord God, to be able to make this important uh, decision, to take this important step in our lives if we have not done so uh, yet. Father God, help us. This is one of the most important decisions we'll ever make here on earth. And for the rest of us that have already made this decision, help us, Father, to, to always remember what you have done for us and to worship you, to praise you, to glorify your name and to live a life that is worthy of our calling, a life that will glorify your name in Jesus Christ's mighty name. We thank you and honor you now and forevermore. Amen.
Thank you for joining us and we cannot wait to see you again tomorrow for day three, which is the last day of the conference. Remember that tomorrow's session will happen in the morning, not in the evening. Enjoy the rest of the evening and see you tomorrow.